Welcome all. Got a great lineup and many, many people joining us. So thank you all for uh, taking the time to join us this uh, morning, this afternoon for many of us um, for uh, some insight into the hydrogen and CCUS innovation funding calls currently underway, as well as proposed, uh, as well as some insight into some uh, tips and tricks on uh, winning non-dilutive funding, which is, uh, of course, uh, an area of uh, key focus for everyone. A reminder that today's session is being recorded. Um, and uh, so, of course, the audio and video will be available um, for folks to access at, at their convenience. And we'll be sending that out through our usual channels, through CMC and Foresight. Uh, but once again, welcome and, and thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a big week for CCUS and, uh, of course, a, a big week um, as well uh, for the, uh, the, the various uh, calls, big month, I should say, for the various funding calls that are underway. Um, so with that, let's, let's jump to the second slide. Uh, just a reminder about today's session. So again, yeah, it's an overview of the funding calls. Um, and some discussion around how to submit a successful application and how to avoid some of the common fitful halls that uh, trip things up for people, uh, as well as what else is coming. And a reminder, the session is being recorded. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a quick overview of the agenda. We have uh, the hour. We'll try and jump right into the presentations from our terrific speakers momentarily. Um, and uh, give you uh, as much time with them, including Q&A. We've cooked up a few questions to kick the conversation off, so we'll use those. And you're welcome, of course, at any time to post questions in the chat that we'll bring through uh, to our discussion at the end. Um, and with that, uh, let's go to the next slide. So we have uh, terrific uh, speakers today. Graham Allen, Manager of Investments and Partnerships at NRCAN's Office for Energy Research and Development. Uh, David Van Den Assum, uh, who's uh, had numerous roles in the ecosystem and currently is the director of the Hydrogen Center of Excellence that's been established in Alberta uh, to support innovation in that space. Um, and uh, of course, this, this seminar is being brought to you by the Clean Resource Innovation Network, CRIN, where I sit as vice chair uh, and Dave sits as theme lead for the low emission value added products theme. Um, uh, and we'll speak a bit more about CRIN momentarily, uh, but I also want to give you a brief introduction to Carbon Next, uh, which is where I'm spending my time today. Um, and uh, Carbon Next is really focused on supporting that next generation of CCUS and hydrogen innovations to widespread commercialization and adoption. Next slide, please. Um, so, a reminder uh, that uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, has been identified by the IPCC as imperative. Um, you know, most forecasts suggest that uh, we'll need between five and 10 gigatons per year of CCUS by roughly 2050 in order to meet our uh, decarbonization objectives. So CCUS representing about one fifth the total uh, mitigation effort uh, by then suggests a huge ramp up in the sector, uh, which includes, of course, production of, of uh, low carbon hydrogen. Uh, to support uh, decarbonization in our heavy industrial sectors. Next slide, please. Um, and a reminder that Canada is a global leader. That, you know, we made some early investments in this space um, to develop projects. So today we've got a disproportionate share of the total global pool of, of projects, as well as roughly uh, one seventh of all the tons that have uh, ever been captured and, and stuffed underground have, have uh, that experience has, has happened here in Canada. Um, you know, there's tremendous natural carbon sink capacity. We've had carbon markets active in this country, actively transacting carbon uh, since roughly uh, 2000 and geez, 2007 um, in Alberta. And of course, we have a disproportionate share of the global pool of patents in CCUS technologies. So of course, many, many countries and, and a lot of focus has turned to this space in the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. So recognizing that there's a real challenge in driving down the cost and improving the performance of the technologies in the space, IEA identifies that about uh, about half of the applications for which C CCUS is needed have, have not been commercially demonstrated yet. Many of the technologies are still in the prototype 
uh, stage or at a, a kind of cost and performance stage that would make them uneconomic, obviously, in today's uh, carbon prices, but even as as prices rise as high as three or four hundred dollars a ton, so we need to drive down the cost of of these technologies and improve their performance and broaden the uh, demonstration of their viability to enable commercial finance to step in where government no longer needs to tread to support the innovations that are necessary. Um, so, how do we get more commercial solutions to market? Uh, next slide. So uh, a partnership was formed uh, last year between Foresight, Canada's largest clean tech accelerator, uh, with uh, proven training and other kinds of support for emerging innovators. And uh, next slide, Carbon Management Canada, which is a uh, leading provider of Canada's uh, industrial solutions in the heavy industrial space, um, and uh, which operates a number of test bed facilities uh, in BC and Alberta, focused on uh, improving the performance of technologies and uh, supporting uh, global impact and results. Uh, next slide. Where CCUS covers not just capture, but also uh, conversion, uh, monitoring, uh, sequestration, and, and uh, the broad range of technologies across all of those which are, are being advanced uh, in tandem. Uh, Carbon Next, is our effort to establish a, a single hub and point of entry to the ecosystem of support for CCUS and to align that ecosystem of support to support um, innovators in the space. Uh, we're doing that by uh, building collaboration a lot across a number of partners in the ecosystem, um, leveraging existing infrastructure, including our um, uh, uh, test bed facilities in BC and Alberta, but also those of other partners. I look forward to, to telling you more about that shortly. Um, setting up uh, support, including uh, around funding and funding partners, uh, and of course, growing and scaling uh, carbon tech or CCUS and hydrogen focused ventures through training, mentoring, uh, validation, and other sorts of support. And really positioning the country as a global leader in this space, building on uh, what we already have and the experience uh, of so many of you and so many others in the community as evidenced by the nearly 2,000 people that participated in the uh, conference on CCUS in Edmonton just this week. Um, so with that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder of the different technologies that we cover um, and the technologies we're looking to support. We're running continuous intake. So if you have solutions and are looking for help, how do I, how do I navigate the ecosystem? What other sorts of support are out there for me? Uh, come to us and we'll, we'll provide a, a link for that a little later on. Um, next slide, please. And of course, a, a key role of Carbon Next is to bring together industry and help you understand uh, the demand pull. Who's out there who's looking for these technologies? And uh, here I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, David Van Den Assem, and ask him to put on his clean resource hat, uh, recognizing that oil and gas has been the leading investor globally in CCUS with Canadian uh, producers at, at the forefront of that group. Uh, David, over to you. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, hi, Dave Van Den Assem, uh, the Director of uh, Clean Technology at Alberta Innovates, and uh, also, as you heard, Director of, the, uh, of Clean of um, the Hydrogen Center of Excellence and uh, theme lead for uh, the low emissions value add products within the Clean Resource Innovation Network uh, or CRIN. Uh, so a little bit about CRIN, a uh, pan-Canadian initiative that was created with the goal that Canada become a global leader in clean hydrocarbons from source to end use. Uh, to achieve these goals, uh, CRIN focused on several theme areas, seven in particular, and, and subsectors within that, uh, that are um, focused on some of the key environmental challenges, uh, including, of course, the most pressing one, climate change. So those, those seven categories include digital oil and gas, novel hydrocarbon extraction, land and well site reclamation, methane monitoring, uh, quantification and assessment, cleaner fuels, reducing carbon intensity, water technology, and of course the low emissions value add products, which is where uh, hydrogen and CCUS uh, sit. So, um, CRIN's focused on uh, creating connections and collisions between the many nodes of the innovation ecosystem. Uh, that's one of its main objectives and the outcome intended is to uh, be, to lead the global transformation to a cleaner energy future. Uh, so 
CRIN members can include innovators, clean technology companies, um, technology adopters, producers, funders, government, researchers, academics, young professionals, and anyone uh, interested in working uh, towards reducing emissions in oil and gas. Uh, so if you haven't done so already, uh, I encourage you to join CRIN today. Memberships are free and it allows you to stay in touch and up to date with uh, what's happening with emerging technologies. Uh, through regular updates, monthly newsletters, attending and participating in uh, knowledge sharing events like this one, and uh, collaborating with uh, diverse people in, in like-minded communities and connecting with others uh, in the sector. So if you want to uh, learn a, a bit more about CRIN, please uh, visit the website, cleanresourceinnovation.com. And with that, we can move on to the next one.
So uh, why don't we dive right in here? So um, this this whole discussion came about as we were talking about uh, some upcoming uh, calls for proposals between um, Alberta Innovates, the Hydrogen Center of Excellence, and ARCAN, and, and a number of others. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to share some of the um, lessons learned that we've experienced over the past few years on uh, you know what it takes to uh, to write a, a great proposal, and um, and so it's kind of I've concentrated my slides in in some of the things I've observed. But this first page is uh, a number of the activities that are happening or will be happening through the Hydrogen Center of Excellence uh, under the under, under the Alberta Innovates umbrella. First one is the Advancing Hydrogen Competition One, which um, the expressions of interest are being reviewed currently. So unfortunately we weren't able to time it to uh, for the EOI proponents to participate in this event, but uh, uh, it'll be useful for those who are able to proceed to the full proposal. We also have a continuous intake services capacity, which is focused on studies, analyses, uh, and, and then supporting codes and standards development for hydrogen deployment. So that because it's continuous intake, this, uh, this information will be relevant to those who are uh, submitting for that. Uh, we also have some capital dollars set aside um, for helping improve the uh, testing um, capabilities and, and building facilities at our Inatech uh, and CIFR subsidiary facilities. Uh, the second competition uh, under the Hydrogen Center of Excellence will be opening as the projects we're currently reviewing are anticipated to be winding down. So hopefully there's a nice flow uh, between those two, but it will be open to everybody. Uh, and it will open late 2024, early 2025. It'll be about a $35 million um, fund. We are anticipating to be joined with some later TRL stage funders uh, at, for the second one, so we can cover a broader spectrum. Uh, but in addition to those, there's also the continuous intake that Alberta Innovates is doing through clean resources, as well as the entrepreneur investments team. So if your focus area is beyond just hydrogen and uh, CCUS, there are many other programs. Uh, a lot of the, what I'm going to tell you next is relevant to those as well. And I mean, I've also supported NRCAN with their proposals. Uh, other environment uh, or sorry other government departments within the province uh, also have experience with uh, sustainable development technology Canada so this is kind of a merging of all of that uh, experience for you so some of the key things that uh, are recommended for proposals are um, let's see if we can move the move the people out of the way so that you can see the full screen are uh, I've, I've listed a bunch here, and uh, they may or may not match exactly the, um, the the categories within a proposal, but the theme uh, is, is should be fairly consistent from one group to the next. And so the first bit is is really identifying what the problem is that you're trying to fix, and then what your solution is, and and what your innovation is. So that's in strategizer terms is uh, known as problem solution fit. Uh, here's where you get to, you know, to really lay out the groundwork. This is this is this is what we're trying to solve, and this is how we're trying to do it. This is where you can talk about your technology, but I've emphasized briefly um, because there's a, such a thing as oversharing, and uh, at the expense of perhaps some of the other content that you see below. We'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, once you've established your problem solution fit, then you can start discussing the you know how you rate relative your to your competitors. What's your what's your competitive differentiator? Uh, what is your market? How big is this? Uh, what's your total addressable market? Your serviceable addressable market? Your adoption rate that you anticipate to get? Um, all of that, along with um, a little bit of the business model, gets into the product market fit side of things. Also, a strategizer concept. Uh, and so if you're able to demonstrate that you can actually, you know, eat the product, your solution, the, the product that you're providing is a solution that the market is interested in, that is uh, super important. And that takes a tremendous amount of effort uh, and it should be done fairly early days. So you're not spending money and developing tech that nobody wants. Um, so super important piece. So being able to demonstrate that in a proposal that you've done that work is is really highly valuable. 
Uh, the next grouping is around the, the business model. So how are you going to operate your business? What is your revenue uh, source or sources? Um, what are your costs? How does it all fit together? Who are your suppliers? What are you keeping in house? What are you farming out to others? Uh, your commercialization pathway, which is somewhat related, but it's how you're going to get from here to here to uh, commercial operations, and then um, maybe just touching a little bit on the scope of the project. But uh, primarily, those two pieces are are ensuring that you've got a business model fit. So uh, you're you're putting out a an opportunity that the market is can work with. Um, and uh, we can maybe get into that a little bit in the q a if you like uh, on, on the project management side of things is where we're actually diving into what are you going to do on this project what are your what are your scopes how are you breaking it down what are your key performance indicators your outcomes uh, that you anticipate at each stage uh, as well as the risks and mitigations um, with every piece of scope there's going to be risks and mitigations that need to be addressed and, and outlined so that uh, the reviewers have an idea of where, um, how you're going to manage things moving forward, uh, especially over the last few years. Uh, I have not had a single project that has not had at least one scope change, some many scope changes, just it's been an interesting few years. So uh, being able to uh, have a plan for how you're going to deal with things when they go sideways is, is super helpful. Uh, as well, here's a here's a chance to show off the uh, the team that you've got, uh, including your your partners and their their folks, um, and just start to uh, outline the budget, how it's going to be spent, where it's going to be spent, and the ask specifically. Each each funder will have a different structure for how they would like to see that, um, but uh, being able to articulate what each of those uh, items is and how much you think it's going to be uh, always helpful uh, when uh, when going through your planning stages and then reflecting that uh, knowledge and experience to the reviewers um, <clears throat> your value proposition is really where you see what are the impacts and benefits that you will gain um, some of that comes through the, um, the economic uh, aspects of what's, how big a market do you think you can get, which also ties into your, uh, the market identification piece. But um, what's your revenue? How's a, how, how can that make an impact? How can those rip, ripple out to benefits to the community? Uh, so hiring high quality professionals, um, circulating dollars through the economy, uh, growing business, uh, ventures in the in the province in the region across the country wherever and um, and then any supplementary information and we'll get into that one in the, in the next slide here so a couple of uh, things that I've I've seen over the years uh, not specific to any particular proposal um, but have seen some trends that I thought I'd share First on the on the, the good good practices, um, the first one I would suggest is uh, usually if there's a call or even an open um, um, continuous intake type program, there is a program guide or an application guide or both, and those are put together by the folks that are running the the, the proposals and uh, or the proposal call. And they're intended to be able to answer the vast majority of questions that come through and give the proponents an opportunity to really dive into um, some of the details of how am I going to fill this thing in? What, is the, uh, what are the reviewers looking for? Uh, what are the important areas? And, and what, what should I include and what should I not include in this proposal? So definitely worth your while to read those guides. Uh, thought goes into them, so it's uh, encouraged to, uh, uh, to, to have a look at those. Uh, ensure that you're eligible. This is always documented in the guides, um, but it's inevitable that we will see a number of proposals that come through any competition where they're missing uh, a couple of key, one or more key components that essentially make them ineligible for that particular call, whether their uh, technology readiness is at a different stage than what the, uh, the call is for, or they're in a different field, or they're, you know, they're just 
focused in a different area than that what that particular call was looking for. It's unfortunate, but it does happen um, quite regularly. So I uh, highly encourage you to ensure that your eligibility is, is aligned with what that particular call is intending to do. Um, often you can get um, in contact with somebody that you can just confirm uh, that and, and other questions about the proposal or if the guides aren't 100% clear on a particular aspect. Uh, so please you know, reach out to ask questions if a contact number or email is provided. I encourage you to make use of it. Uh, not off, not the ability to provide responses not all this isn't always the case. So uh, when those opportunities do exist I, and you do have questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. Um, and sometimes uh, one can get guidance with the drafts of their, uh, of their proposals. Not often. Uh, there's, there's some, uh, you know, need to be um, providing equal opportunity for everybody to, to submit their proposals and have them be graded equally. Uh, so sometimes the calls won't really necessarily allow for uh, being able to provide guidance in, in for a draft, um, other than just things that are related perhaps to the, what's in the guide and interpretation of the guide. So you can't always get that, but when you do, it's super valuable. So you know, I encourage you to uh, take advantage of it if it is there. Another one, uh, submitting early. Um, I've had a few experiences where uh, folks are trying the last minute to get the last little bits of information into the system uh, only to at five minutes before the closing period, have a computer crash on them. And, uh, and to be fair to everybody, those closing periods need to be applied equally to everybody. So it's a cause for a lot of panic and uh, you know, a lot of hard work gone into a proposal that may not actually be able to make it into the system. So uh, submit early. Um, just actually one experience I just had. Uh, I've worked on my slides for this and did some tidying up uh, on this last night and sent them over to Jason. and. Uh, just before we got on the air here, I realized that for some reason there's another deck that was exactly the same name <laughs> that was an old deck and it didn't have the right info. So last minute scramble, um, had to get the info together. So, uh, or, or they could get the correct slide deck up. So um, these things happen, uh, happen to everybody. So just make sure you uh, give yourself lots of time. And then uh, being concise, but clear. Uh, there's usually a limited amount of space in a, in a proposal to write something. So uh, highly recommended to really hone the message, really fine tune it so that we're getting all the information we need in the fewest words possible so that you're not writing pages and pages of work and the reviewers have an efficient time to read. Uh, we have seen um, the things at either end of the spectrum and we'll get into the don't do these pieces. How am I, how am I doing for time there, Jason? A couple minutes? One, okay, I'll go through these super quick. Again, don't wait till the last minute. Uh, Oversharing and undersharing. I've seen proposals where none of, the, none of the boxes are filled in, but they've attached a proposal that they've done from a previous one. May or may not cover the bases that we were looking for, um, which is hard to do. Uh, Oversharing, I've seen uh, where we have an opportunity to, you know, do a uh, do an attachment. Uh, I've seen 160 pages of attachments. Really hard to manage that uh, for multiple reviewers. Uh, so, you know, I encourage you to be again concise and clear. Uh, glossing over ignoring sections, kind of talked about that. Um, they're there for a reason, and reviewers will be grading on each section that's in that proposal. So, if you overlook a section or a component of a section, it's really hard to grade that. Uh, and then getting back to our earlier bit about product market fit, problem solution fit, um, spending too much time on building something that nobody's gonna buy because you haven't gone out to talk to somebody and ask the market what they need and done that in market analysis and got, got, gotten that validation from the market is, um, uh, you know, 
really dangerous <laughs> for for your finances as well as for the uh, the success of your your venture and your project. And then another one, uh, you know, if there's opportunity to to have feedback uh, on a proposal, perhaps a, a proposal that was not successful, the the feedback is intended to be supportive and help you guide towards uh, the right path uh, for for helping you to be successful. Um, occasionally, some folks are very passionate about their projects and their technology and see any kind of criticism as being uh, um, uh, taken the wrong way. And, uh, and, and there's some defensiveness that can, can sometimes build up. So I encourage you to be open minded. Um, everyone's trying to help. Uh, we want you to succeed. So uh, anything, everything is help is intended to be in the greatest your greatest good. So with that, I think that is my last uh, slide. Yes. So I can stop sharing. And oh, I'm gonna stop share, and then let uh, Graham take over. And over to you, Graham. Uh, I believe Thanks, uh, Shannon's got your deck. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, just so while the deck is is coming up here. Um, yeah, so my name is Graham Allen, just uh, to reiterate manager of investments and uh, partnerships at the Office of Energy Research and Development within Natural Resources Canada. Um, so I'm looking forward to maybe I'll start off with just um, telling folks a bit about uh, the Office of Energy R&D and our kind of flagship uh, program, the Energy Innovation Program. Uh, so the Office of Energy R&D um, leads the Government of Canada's efforts in delivering energy research development and demonstration funding. So we focus on influencing the, uh, the pace and the direction of energy systems transformation, uh, targeting the most impactful technologies uh, that we feel can maximize environmental and economic outcomes very much with Canada's 2030 and, and 2050 decarbonization targets in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the Office of Energy R&D has a long history, and so we have uh, run a number of programs that uh, folks may know us for, including the um, Clean Growth Program, Green Infrastructure Programs, uh, the Impact Canada Clean Tech Challenges, um, and Breakthrough Energy Solutions Canada. There's, there's quite a long list there. We have made a move to consolidate um, a lot of those different programs and, and lessons learned from the variety of approaches that we've taken under the Energy Innovation Program banner. So the Energy Innovation Program really covers the full waterfront of um, energy innovation solutions uh, from community-based decarbonization uh, solutions to uh, decarbonization of transportation, industrial decarbonization, and um, we kind of organize ourselves under the missions of improving energy efficiency uh, and processes to reduce emissions from energy end use, developing cleaner fuels pathways, accelerating electrification and maximizing benefits of low emitting heat and power, um, and maintaining safe and resilient energy systems. And so um, we have an annual uh, grants and contributions budget that we leverage to run targeted calls in different areas that we feel are uh, aligned with the kind of impact objectives that we have for the program. Um, but in addition to this annual budget, we also run through the Energy Innovation Program uh, complementary funds. Um, and so maybe we'll switch to the next slide with this point, but uh, complementary funds um, that sometimes are a bit more uh, target specific in their nature. So an example of this is as part of budget 2021, the Government of Canada announced um, its intention to invest $319 million over seven years uh, into research, development, and demonstration that uh, will advance the commercial viability of CCUS technologies. So a portion of this $319 million is going towards supporting um, uh, activities across the network of our federal labs. Um, the remainder is being delivered through the Energy Innovation Program. And in 2021-22, um, we launched the initial call for proposals uh, that allocated a portion of this funding 
to support front-end engineering and design studies for large-scale CCUS facilities. We selected uh, 11 projects in April 2022 uh, that received support through this call. If anyone wants additional information on those projects, that's available on our website. Um, and then after that call, we've turned our attention to um, earlier stage uh, CCUS RD and D activities in the uh, in three different focus areas: capture, storage, and sequestration, and utilization. And the way that we're running this call for proposals is um, we've launched the intake for the first focus area, capture, and then um, we will sequence into uh, opening intakes for the remaining focus areas in the coming months. And I can speak a bit about those timelines later. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the... Uh, CCUS uh, RD&D capture focus area, um, its aim is to support RD&D of next generation CO2 capture technologies and processes uh, that have the potential to significantly reduce capital and or operating costs uh, for capturing CO2 and also to increase uh, the applicability of these solutions to different emission sources, sizes, and CO2 concentrations. Um, and that's all in comparison to um, commercially available amine-based uh, CO2 capture technologies. Um, the, I would really encourage folks who are interested um, in, in uh, learning more about this call to go and visit our website. And there's a very detailed applicant's guide that walks through eligibility, um, walks through the different funding amounts that are available. I will just uh, speak to the fact that there are two different um, kind of areas. We are accepting proposals for R&D projects, um, which are eligible uh, for up to, um, it's a minimum of 500,000 and a maximum of uh, uh, 2.5 million in contributions from the Energy Innovation Program. That can go to support up to 75% of total project costs. And the project lifespan can be up to five years. Um, we also have demonstration stage funding available, which has a minimum um, uh, support of a million and a maximum support of five million uh, that can go to support up to 50% of total project costs. Again, also five-year timeline for those projects. Uh, there is some detailed information on the types of activities that are eligible for each of those uh, kind of portions of, the, of our programming, each of those supports. Um, so I'd encourage folks who are interested to go in and consult the applicant's guide for that detailed information. We run our programs in uh, phases. Uh, for those who are not familiar with that, we, we start off with uh, an intake of expressions of interest. We tend to receive a really high volume of applications uh, from across the country at, at this stage of our programming. It's a little bit lighter touch, um, and we leverage that stage of the program to down select to um, uh, an invite list of, of uh, proponents that are invited to participate in the full project proposal stage, uh, where we'll be evaluating a more detailed proposal of the project. So you can see here on the slide um, that the deadline for the submission of expressions of interest for the capture focus area under this call is coming up very quickly. It's October 3rd. Uh, we'll then take those uh, proposals and our technical review committee will take a look at them uh, throughout the remainder of the fall and um, uh, successful, well, all applicants will be notified of the outcomes in, in early winter 2023 and successful applicants will be invited to the next stage of the program. Um, I saw a quick question pop up just about uh, the TRL levels. And so the TRL levels uh, in terms of eligibility for the, the intake writ large is between two and seven. Um, and then again, I just point folks to the applicants guide and the activities that are eligible under the R&D stream of, of the programming versus the demo to just kind of right size what you should be looking for with your proposal. Um, so with that, maybe I'll flip to the next slide and uh, just mention that, as I said before, we've opened the intake for our capture uh, focus area, but we will have storage and sequestration coming up next. 
Um, we don't have an exact launch date for that yet, but it's going to be in the coming months. We're, we're going to launch that likely later in the fall. Um, and then uh, that will be followed by the opening of the intake for utilization. Um, and that will come in the winter. Um, so for storage, we are focused on both um, characterization related activities and solutions that can support uh, those activities to develop safe, permanent subsurface CO2 storage. Um, we don't have additional details on the exact criteria uh, that's publicly available yet. So in terms of the question and answer period, I won't be uh, able to answer many of the questions until we have uh, that kind of scope finalized and the information publicly available. Same with utilization stream. Uh, but uh, we can, if you want to send an email to the address here on the screen, um, we can absolutely add you to the distribution list. So as soon as additional information on this programming is available, we can share it with uh, folks who are interested. Um, I think with that, I'm gonna pause. I know uh, David gave a lot of really great insight into um, what constitutes a good proposal. A lot of that is very much in line with, uh, with our guidance. I know we're gonna get into that a little bit more in our panel discussion. So I'm gonna stop there and, and uh, maybe leave the, the rest of the time to get into some uh, conversation. Thanks so much. Perfect, thank you. And uh, you know, once again, here's our speakers. Maybe we can uh, we can turn off the slides so that uh, you can uh, have the opportunity to engage with our speakers a bit. And uh, I'll I'll be monitoring the chat as well. So feel free to post questions uh, like Milad did in the uh, in the chat. But let's kick things off, guys. So. Uh, you know, one of the comments, David, that you made, which I thought was quite interesting, is oversharing. So. You know, these these applications can be pretty detailed in terms of what they're asking for. How do you avoid oversharing while while providing the, the kind of necessary content to demonstrate that, um, you know, that, that you've done the work, that you're you're a, a credible recipient? Yeah, that's a it's a fine line. It's a bit of an art, uh, honestly, the um, you know, some of the. I'd say. I'd say being able to effectively communicate to a technical audience, the uh, like technically savvy audience, the concept that your solution is is providing, without having to attach dozens of technical papers at the end uh, to to help explain it, um, but not uh, not just stating what it is and then providing a link to a bunch of papers that do explain what it is. So those are kind of the two ends of the spectrum. Um, the character limits or the word limits uh, are sometimes a bit of a guide on, on you know, how, how much detail is being requested at a particular stage. Um, so I have seen some proposals in where there isn't that character limit per section, uh, you know, 80 to 90% of it is describing the technology, which, you know, all of those other bullets I put in there are now squished into one or two sentences and it becomes a very skewed uh, paper. And on the other end, as I, as I mentioned, there's, there's dozens and dozens of pages of technical support documents or business plans for that matter uh, that, are, that are appended that, that it makes it very difficult for a reviewer to, uh, to to plow through all that stuff, honestly. So, yeah. So there's no there's no magic uh, solution, but uh, using the available space is, is maybe a reasonable guide. And uh, learning to parse one's language and and be concise and precise might might help. Thanks for that, David. Graham, anything you'd add? Yeah, I just say, and I'm, I'm kind of double clicking on a point that David already mentioned, and I'm going to do this probably with every response I give, but just using the applicant's guide as the North Star and really taking the time uh, to try and internalize not just what the information is that you need to populate fields with, but really the objectives. It's like David said, a lot of thought goes into those documents, and it it is uh, really surprising the amount of times where um, applications get screened out after probably a ton of time that goes into preparing them, 
just because uh, there's been, I think, a bit of a glossing over of, of some of the things that the programs asked for. And so I think that um, really digging into those documents and trying to put yourself in the shoes of the evaluation committee that is going to be using that document as a, as a guidance tool to try and navigate their decision making um, is, is, like David said, it's an art, but it's, it's really, I think, um, the best guidance you have, but where we also see a lot of slip ups. Um, so really trying to keep the, the narrative in each section tight and really responding to what you can kind of see in terms of the objectives that are laid out for, for the call uh, or the program. A related question around the importance, uh, how, how would you rate the importance of providing references for facts provided uh, to support market competition and so on? Okay, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, yeah, I think that's that's super helpful. It shows that uh, proponents uh, done a bit of digging, done some homework on it. Uh, if we want to go back and fact check on things, we have the ability to do that. Um, so yeah, it starts to demonstrate quantitative analysis of particular components. So it's appreciated, and of course the uh, you know the attachments can be where the reference is, so you don't have to you know mess up your character count on uh, a reference list. Uh, so that's what I would suggest. Graham, thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. That's uh, nothing to add there. You also have a lot more experience with dealing with those. So. <laughs> Okay, one, uh, I, I was going to save this for the speed round, Milad, but uh, multiple applications or a single application? I can uh, may maybe jump on that one. I think the, the, the guidance here is that what we don't want to see is a fragmentation of a single project to, to try and kind of stuff uh, different elements into the same process. If there are distinct uh, separate projects that are pursuing different innovation objectives, um, you know, for, for NRCAM, we're happy to see multiple projects come through the process. Uh, but yeah, it, it just has to be very clear what the different pieces are and why they had to be separate projects. Ditto. David? Yeah, just clear communication why they're different. Acknowledging that they're there, but uh, yeah, being clear about why they're two separate things. And would you reference the, the separate applications? In, in each one or, or is that not necessary? It, it can't hurt. Uh, it, it will come up in the uh, consensus meeting for sure. Um, so one way or another, uh, it'll get out there. So might as well uh, call it. And I think uh, especially where there is any type of interdependency, um, uh, it's really important to, to reference the, each other's projects. If you have kind of two island projects that notionally could be seen as one relying on the other, um, that can really gum up an evaluation process if it's not clear what the, how they're being dealt with separately. Great, thank you. Um, a treatment of IP is often an issue with, with uh, public funding. Uh, would you care to comment on how, um, how your, your respective funding approaches uh, affect an applicant's IP? Graham, I'll put you on the spot first. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so this is actually where um, in the, the specific guide for this CCUS rd and call in the capture focus area, if you go into one of our um, appendix, uh, you can go and you can see kind of the outline criteria uh, that are going to be used to, to score the application. And there is a section on IP. We ask for the kind of clear IP story to be told. Um, there is, um, we want to know first and foremost, is there generation of new IP, uh, through the project and what's the strategy for protecting that IP? Um, is there existing IP that's already protected that, you know, the solutions being advanced through this project, we want to, we want to get a clear sense for the exact ownership. Uh, of that IP? Is it the lead proponent that owns it? Is it a licensing arrangement? If it's a licensing arrangement, uh, what's the exclusivity that's there? Um, so we want the, the clear picture. Um, there's a lot of flexibility to fund different IP arrangements. I think the biggest concerns come up for us when there are questions around 
um, the, the kind of long-term access to that IP uh, when there are questions around just the IP, the quality of the IP strategy in general, uh, or when there is a sense that this is a project that is not really pushing a solution forward or, or generating new intellectual property. Um, so that's kind of the general kind of guiding posts. And um, yeah, again, would direct folks to kind of the language we have in the applicant's guide. David? Yeah, I'd support uh, everything that was said there. Um, I'm gonna sort of expand on that into confidentiality. Uh, it's often it comes up as a concern that uh, if I share with you what my, my secret sauce is, you know, it's gonna get out there. Um, governments have a pretty good firewall um, around confidential information. Uh, we, it's it's all in all of our contracts to protect it and maintain it. Um, and um, so, and the, and the way we've structured our proposals in particular is there's a, a sort of non-confidential summary uh, that, that, you know, is, is high level. And then the rest of the proposal is confidential um, information. And so therefore it, it has a level of um, protection from uh, FOIP. Um, so there, there's, there's that aspect as well. The, what I have seen in, in some cases is uh, folks that may have had some bad experiences in the past from wherever and are very reticent to give out any kind of confidential information or they see it as sort of uh, um, creating some kind of you know uh, mystery or mystique around their, their technology. Um, I wanna be very clear that we, and I don't think any public funder will fund a black box. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So I've yet to see one that's been successful. I uh, highly encourage you to be clear and open about what you're doing. Um, most of the reviewers at the other end are going to be either technical experts that have been chosen to look at your specific technology because that's their background, or they're going to be business experts and they understand uh, IP and protection and competitive edge and all that stuff. So one way or another, um, the folks are going to really um, get what you're doing and need to understand what you're doing. And I guess related to that is, does it matter for these funding calls whether the IP is domiciled in Canada or, or you know, the U.S. or elsewhere? Yeah, I can I can jump on that. So um, that's a you have to be, I think. Um, uh, really sensitive to the different program you're dealing with, because there's different answers for that question, depending on who you're seeking funding from. Um, so from the the NRCAN, and, uh, and I'll actually just even specifically within NRCAN, you could see different approaches across different programs, depending on what their kind of policy mandate is. So for the, the energy innovation program, we have flexibility to fund uh, projects where the IP uh, is is held outside of Canada. There's some type of parent structure company that that um, is outside of Canada, or even it's technology that's licensed from outside of Canada. I would say if you put two projects side by side, that all other things are equal, and you have one project that is advancing Canadian IP that is clearly held within Canada, it will be viewed favorably. I think that's that's kind of uh, a safe thing to say. Does that happen a lot? Um, uh, I think uh, I think we tend to factor it into decision making, but we have a lot of flexibility. Uh, is is I think the bottom line of the energy innovation program. I was going to say pretty much the same thing. Uh, each program is specific. Each organization has its own requirements. You know, as when I was there, Sustainable Development Technology Canada required that the companies be Canadian, like full stop. So we have a bit more flexibility at Alberta Innovates, um, although we do want to see that they're at least registered in Alberta. Uh, so there's some folks that are you know, working on that right now. We, so there's, there's, a, there's a different range, again, the guide and, and talking to a, a person on the other end of the line will, will help to clarify those. Perfect. Guys, let me ask, uh, just confirm, are we able to go over the hour uh, can I'm we good. go 10 minutes past the hour? I'm good. Good. Okay. So
So uh, let's keep the conversation going. Next question, uh, does matching funding have to be in place before submission of the EII, EOI? And what about the final project proposal? So um, for us, uh, does not need to be completely nailed down by EOI. Um, it can be in final stages of being completed by a full proposal. Uh, if one is awarded, it's a condition of the contract that the balance of funds are uh, secured. So there's, there's time uh, through the process from, from our end. Yeah, it's the same response uh, from our end as well. And it's funny, I think there were there are a lot of these questions that David and, and I could almost answer for each other because, uh, you know, we, we've we been uh, such uh, really been lucky to be such close partners with Alberta Innovates that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, program influence on, on each other's processes. So we're like brothers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You've taken the CCUS and hydrogen pledges together. Um, okay, so maybe a, a kind of follow up is really what does it mean to have the funding in place? Do you need to have a check kind of written? Is it a contract in place? What's what's evidence that you've secured those funds? We we'll usually um, look for just a one pager from the, um, the the source of funds saying, yeah, they're confirmed. Um, I have seen full contracts sent my way. Don't really need that. Um, some some one page or even the front page of it is, is fine if it's got a dollar amount on it. Uh, yeah, it, something more than just words on a it filled in on the form, uh, filled in on our form. <laughs> some some something will help. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is it's a same response, and you know have seen pitfalls in the past where just making sure that you're detail oriented to have that letter of support and confirmation um make sure it shows up clearly in the in whatever budget document you have to submit and is very clear and easily traceable which portion of, of funds or in-kind supports coming from where um just making sure that the the story is kind of easy to follow throughout the package is is uh, valuable great um and I guess related to that, um, you know, when you've got earlier stage technologies, comment from the chat, uh, you know, the, the level of risk is higher. Finding that corporate partner can be a lot harder. Also, the, the check size is, is smaller. Um, so really, this is a question of, are you a lead investor as a funder or are you the follow on? Um. It really depends on where you're at with your conversations with the others, I would say. Um, so in some cases, you know, we could be the last one on your list uh, to get through the process and you will have finalized everything, in which case, you know, it's um, when you get, if and when you get the conditional approval from us, it, it's evidence for the others. So they can then go ahead and finalize. If it's the other way around and, and we happen to be the first one in your funnel with the timelines, uh, then, Again, we could use, assuming you're successful, a, a conditional letter of acceptance or approval as evidence to the others that are coming uh, that, hey, the, the dollars are there if you're there. And, uh, and once everything then comes together, then we can finalize the contract. Contribution agreement, sorry. I, I wanna double click on that if I can, because I love that's a great sentence too. Uh, and ask you then, David, um, uh, so now you're, you've applied, you've, you've been told you, you weren't shortlisted uh, or you, you're not a recipient in that first round. Does anybody like, you know, some of these, uh, it sounds like some of these uh, decisions are conditional. Do you ever kind of move down the list if, if uh, something falls apart commercially for one of the lead applicants? I have seen, yeah, we have a, a kind of... Um... What other, what uh, another way to say it, kind of like a reserve list, should some of the ones that were accepted not to uh, follow through, we've got extra dollars, let's, uh, you know, let's spread the joy and we'll work our, work our way down the list. But the list is set up through the consensus meetings with the reviewers through a rigorous process that does have oversight, uh, fairness oversight. So we're comfortable with just going down the list. Um, Graham, you've, you've got some uh, uh, procedures in place for that too. 
Yeah, it's the exact same, uh, exact same approach for us. We always make sure that at the end of our selection process, we have a good sense of, of the uh, projects, the initial set of projects that we're going forward with, but we do have this, like David says, reserve, reserve list uh, to consult should there be issues with any of those projects. Thank you. Um, question around the art of letters of support. Uh, so what else do you want to see in there besides that commitment of dollars? How they're planning on using those dollars? Are they providing just people? Are they providing a site? Are they uh, hosting? Are they putting like investing cash? Um, like he's a cash or in kind, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And and to what depth of are they committing resources of the organization? It'd be be nice to know, but again, that can all be fit into. Uh, a, th a two or three row table within that one page. So uh, we don't need volumes of info on it. Yeah, nothing to add on, on my end. I think that captures it. Well, let's go a little bit further then on what, what makes a good partner? Um, you know, does, does who you have as a, as a partner matter uh, in terms of the selection process? How, how important is it to kind of have that, that plumage of, of letters of, of uh, support around your application. I think pulling from uh, a comment that David made earlier, the where a partner can show that you have that kind of anchor you have, um, you know, I think the partners can sometimes give a really good signal in terms of product market fit. Uh, if there's some level of endorsement from, from a potential future adopter at scale of a technology that, that goes a long way in, in the conversations. Um, I think that uh, there's some really great partnerships with, you know, universities, colleges, uh, uh, labs in Canada, and sometimes uh, internationally that can really strengthen the quality of a project in terms of confidence and knowledge uh, dissemination and uh, um, kind of broader access to the the benefits of the results of uh, you know the knowledge spillover kind of benefits of of some of the stuff that we uh, would be looking to fund. So those that comes to mind. Great. David, anything Graham's, you would Graham's add? alluding to the, the range of how to define a partner, right? There's, there's folks that are contributing um, as a service provider or something to a project, uh, as a, um, a strategic channel partner, as an end user. Um, most of the conversation or most of the discussion I've had so far or uh, context that I've been doing so far in this, this session is about uh, them as a financing partner, but often they they can wear multiple roles or multiple hats, have multiple roles. And so each one is going to have a different nuance to, 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 their, uh, to what their letter is going to say. But I completely agree. Um, the, the more support that we see from end users, the greater our confidence that it is a, uh, it has market pull, it has market interest. There's, uh, you know, there, there will be uptake in the market. So leave it at that. That's great. Um, okay, so uh, what types of activities should not be part of a, a project proposal? What are, what are some boundaries that, that people should be thinking about that might not be kind of commonly thought about? I've seen um, an entire business plan attached to a proposal, uh, which is, okay, there's some interesting information in there, but uh, you know, if it's 40, 50 pages and you've got a 10 page proposal, um, the reviewers then have to go hunting for the data. Um, I would, you know, I appreciate the effort that goes into them. Um, I would suggest exploring business model canvases as a uh, one page version of that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that being able to tailor what you're working on or what you're proposing to, to the reviewers so that you're pulling out the important parts of that would be, would be helpful. Uh, Graham? Yeah, I think you said it before in terms of the kind of balance between um, 
you should d deliver as strong of an argument as possible for your project, making it really clear exactly what you're trying to do and exactly how it lines up with the objectives outlined in the program guide. And then it should be as you should, you should have kind of economy of words in the proposal because, you know, as, as tight of a story as you can tell that still addresses all of those priorities, um, anything beyond that you risk that folks get kind of lost in going down rabbit holes of the information you've provided. So it's like David said, a lot of those long attachments and um, you know, huge packages that then you're trying to go and, and later figure out if, if you've actually hit one of the important evaluation criteria. I think that's, that's the thing to think of. I guess one other thought there um, that came up is uh, proposals that are essentially marketing brochures, uh, not impressed. So, um, you know, we're by and large a technical de-risking organization. Uh, so something that is glossy marketing text and doesn't get into the nuts and bolts of the questions that we're asking, not going to necessarily serve you well. Uh, have seen those um, first, you know, opening paragraph, fine, that's great. But then let's roll our sleeves and really answer the questions. Uh, but throughout the whole proposal, it gets kind of tired. <laughs> There's a market for that, just not here. Well, and I'll, I'll draw people's attention, for example, to Alberta Innovates has provided a detailed overview of their thoughts on CCUS and what's needed in the uh, in the marketplace, as an example. And, and of course, um, we have a national hydrogen strategy that's been in development and, and uh, probably important to look at as part of informing some of the keywords and marketing. Um, folks, we're almost at time, and so I'd like to try an experiment speed round. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, for those who know, I have a podcast and we always fail at this, but it's fun anyway. So, okay, uh, Graham, I'm going to put you on the spot. Speed round. Consultant versus DIY proposal. I don't, I don't have a, a great opinion on, on this one in particular, uh, Jason. I, I, don't, uh, uh, I haven't been on that side of it, so I'm not sure uh, what, what's the best, and I, I couldn't, couldn't have an opinion that would be valuable. I'd say yes or no. Right tool for the job. Uh, if if you have the skills in house, you know how to do them. Do them. If you really don't know how to do this and you need to get some guidance, hire someone to get guidance. Uh, then over time, you'll get used to it and you'll know how to do it yourself. So either or depends on where you're at. David, following on, does location matter? Newfoundland versus Ontario. This is going to be program specific. Um, Alberta Inno Innovates focuses on projects that are being done with benefit accrued to Alberta. It's Alberta taxpayer dollars, so we need to demonstrate that the, uh, there's value being gained for those taxpayer dollars. Um, similarly, any other provincial funder will, will have the same thing. Um, so not to say that if a technology from uh, Cornerbrook wants to uh, demonstrate here in Alberta. Bring it on. Love to see it. Um, Graham, do you have a different Yeah, yeah. So for us, um, uh, definitely priority number one is evaluating the merits of just the quality of the project, but location does factor in. Uh, you know, I think at the end, we do take a look and we do want to make sure that our funding is uh, represented across uh, the country as much as possible. So there's a balancing that, that does happen between those two considerations for sure. Great. Um, geez, we went through a lot of these. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go to the, the uh, does it help to meet with the minister? Right. I think, yeah, yeah, I'll jump on that. So, um, I think in general terms, absolutely. If you can get time with uh, with Minister Wilkinson, um, it's it's uh, it's valuable. He's he's really sharp and and has a really good understanding and, and perspective of uh, what's going on in energy from from coast to coast uh, to coast. And um, uh, but what I would say in terms of for program decisions, these are separate things. We run our processes; they are driven by. Um, 
you know, the kind of scope and design that we set up, which is influenced by policy that's set on, on the political side to some extent. Um, but uh, when it comes down to the kind of nuts and bolts of running a process, the decisions are driven by uh, our technical review committee's uh, in-depth assessment of the projects. And uh, we definitely make uh, the minister aware of uh, the, the recommended projects, but uh, um, yeah, they're separate processes. Yeah, uh, David, very, very much the same answer. Um, the ministers and their, their office will offices will lean on us for that uh, vetting, technical, and commercial de-risking uh, analysis. So we've got the skills; we're tooled for it. So they lean on us for that. So eventually, they'll come to us. Perfect. Well, uh, I want to thank you both. That's also the first successful speed round I've ever seen that I've ever pulled off. So you guys, you get full points for that. Uh, I think on behalf of everybody, we, we thank you for that. Um, so what, what, uh, Shannon, what has gone wrong like, with other ones? Have there been like fist fights or what? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, you know, every topic is quite interesting. There's no such thing as a speed round. Well, I remember this one time. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let me let me take a moment to just uh, uh, remind people of some of the upcoming events for CRIN and for uh, Carbon Next. So, if you wouldn't mind, Shannon, just throwing the slides back up on on uh, on deck, and um, uh, I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Graham and David for their time this afternoon. Uh, once again, uh, we will be posting this uh, this event, uh, the recording of this event, shortly. Um, but I want to remind people that the uh, AGM for CRIN is coming up on September 27th, so that's next week. Um, everyone should attend. It's a great opportunity to find out what's going on and what we're planning with CRIN over the course of the next year. And of course, uh, it's not too late to join the, uh, the next uh, um, uh, Money Talk seminar, which is all about raising uh, capital free uh, to participate in. Um, it's being run by uh, uh, National Bank and, um, and Avatar Innovations on behalf of Corin. Uh, great opportunity to learn uh, about the, the capital stack and how to, how to fill it in, uh, in complement to the non-dilutive session that we just did. Um, and uh, of course, uh, for Carbon Next, we're heading into a busy time. Next slide, please. Um, we're heading towards a, a, sort of a series of uh, public events, including the launch of our newsletter, uh, early next month, and uh, the launch of our monthly Carbon Talk session, which will be on the uh, second Wednesday of each month. Uh, and of course, uh, I look forward to talking more about the uh, one window concierge service that we're setting up to help uh, startups in CCUS and blue and turquoise hydrogen um, access uh, Canada's CCUS research and technology facilities and expertise. Um, so a number of the facilities across Canada uh, that have uh, solutions to support uh, people developing technology in this space um, are going to be part of that. And you won't, won't want to miss that. And then, of course, the launch of our first uh, thought leadership report at the end of, uh, or excuse me, in early November, uh, followed by uh, the launch of a, an innovation challenge, similar to the ones that you've heard about, um, with a call for applicants to join our, our winter Carbon Next cohort. But of course, we're onboarding constantly and providing uh, experienced executive advice and uh, access to Foresight's proven training. Uh, so do uh, reach out to us. A uh, link is right there. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and with that, thanks again to David and Graham. Uh, guys, uh, maybe David, I'll give you the uh, uh, last word on your behalf. Anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap? Uh, no, just thank you everybody for your time. Really appreciate it. And likewise, Graham. Yeah, thanks as well. And thank you, Jason and, and the, the team here for uh, pulling this together. It's a great opportunity to get the information out uh, about uh, these programs. They're both, I think, a really great opportunity for folks. So thanks. Yeah, thanks for your thank you guys. leadership and uh, your tremendous. Thank you. Yeah, the, both you guys. And let me just do a note of thanks to Astrid and Shannon running behind the scenes to clean up decks and get this up and running. And we look forward to many more uh, events going forward, as we said. So thank you again, guys. And thank you, Corinne, uh, for co-hosting with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again very soon.